five second countdown starts for Sarah Choi and the Koreans get us underway. Guys, Sung Kyun getting things moving really quickly from her start position in front of the athlete. Sarah tucking in behind her best she can. If you consider the gap generally for giant slalom gates are say around 20 meters as an average maybe slightly more um the athletes really need and, and guides do need to stay tight as they possibly can well hopefully the koreans are still safely on track um, but you still got your pictures at home but i don't oh here we are got them back some of that rain getting into some of the cabling but uh, again we were mentioning this at the top the Sung Kyun Young guide working really hard to keep an eye best she can on Sarah Choi who's coming down behind her the, she's caught up now so that creates a better connection and allows the athlete to ski more confidently if they're close there's the total time 2.12.72 in this uh, second run the total time for the two legs of the competition added together of course to determine the final time so Sarah Choi they're setting the early pace six girls back in this uh, women's visually impaired competition next up will be Alexandra Rexova another skier who performed a little off a little below par I would say this morning so I think she'll be looking to make amends her guide Hugo Ribar has her out of the gate very very quickly and well, I would say this is a bit more like the form that Rexova has been displaying, particularly across the last few days. Second in Friday's slalom. Third in the previous giant slalom on Thursday. So GS form has, has certainly been on this last uh, week or so. We uh, had an extra race scheduled on Tuesday as well. She placed second in that one behind... Uh, Britain's men and Fitzpatrick and some good news it looks like the weather's brightening up it's still sort of half raining half snowing but hopefully the weather won't get any heavier this hill is tough enough just uh, with the tricky snow and very bumpy conditions that we're facing here because of these warm temperatures Slovakian pair should be safe home from here though. Heading for the line over they go to 1063. So new leader. I think uh, I think yeah, I think Alexandra would be a lot happier with that run compared with uh, the first half of today's competition. You can see clearly there in the background how little snow there is left at the at the bottom section of the hill here on uh, the Italian Alps. Now the local favourite, talking of the Italian Alps, you've got Martina Vozza on course right now. She too having a strong run of giant slalom results these la the last few competitions. Guide urging her on. Yelena Sabadusi feeding information and encouragement back through the Bluetooth headset. Thoughts are working hard to find that outside ski and create the carving force that brings her cleanly and quickly round the turn. Now looking for a bit of aerodynamic help, a little bit early to be honest, but a couple of pretty wide gates there coming across the final crest. Starts to straighten from here though, so yeah, that's it. into the tuck, hopefully pushing, pushing, trying to stay forward, trying to stay close as possible to Elenia. The Italian pair are over the line and they now change the leaderboard. 3.67. Ah, uh, yeah, the local kids that have uh, shown up are loving that. Nothing like being on hand to cheer your heroes and all the other competitors on and uh, 
<laughs> Nobody's enjoying the weather. No, no doubt about that. Boom number one, even Nico. Her lone Greek competitors here. Hi, her guy Dimitris Provenzas setting a pretty solid rhythm up here. They two, though, stretching a little further apart. And I know it's, it's it's a very common misconception that folks who can folks with regular vision think well, at least the visually impaired athletes won't be put off by the bad visibility and wet goggles and so on. I can assure you they're put off even to a greater degree than you or I because B2 athletes scheme with very very limited vision. The small amount that they do have, whether it's light, dark, acute, or general visual acuity, if that is hampered at all in any way, then it's it's really disturbs their ability to feel confident and remain balanced over the skis. So, a great effort being displayed here by Eva Niku. These wet snowflakes stick to the lenses of the goggles and make it impossible. As I say, for both athlete and guy, they're over the line, but oh, that was a close run thing. Just held on to their advantage. They point four two of a second at the top, and I think that's uh, more a measure of Martina Vozza, her really good effort there in the second run. So it's Greece who lead, Italy second, Great Britain in the gate, and Veronica Eigner of Austria just behind her. So into the final two from this final giant slalom of the 2024 season. Fitzpatrick and Guest, very solid partnership here. And uh, as I've been explaining, you can see this is more like what I would say is the ideal distance for a B2 athlete and their guide. They're in these open gates, they're less than a gate apart, which Definitely is of assistance. Katie Guest giving some technical instruction. Strong on the right foot for those long sweeping left curves. There's three of them on this course, particularly long. This next one being a case in point. Oh, Fitzpatrick gets bounced off of that left ski. She goes over to the red gate. And she goes off that final pitch now going for the tuck position needs to try every trick she can to put some pressure on Eigner and force an error from the Austrian clear into the lead there 5.12 and uh, I think uh, a case in point of Fitzpatrick coming to form right now at the end of the season big hello to the folks back home but uh, up in the start gate this will be the deciding run. This is uh, Veronica Eigner with her sister Elizabeth guiding her, and they're out and away. Now, 1.11, there is advantage from the first run over Fitzpatrick and Guest. And it looks like they don't think that that is enough of a buffer, pushing things up to a very fast pace right from the get go. Good connection between the pair of them. Yeah, really doing a great job here of uh, being able to follow the line accurately. Veronica and Elizabeth stretch that advantage to 1.82 of a second over Fitzpatrick. Oh, it's about BS anything in that blue gate just on the crest before the this uh, next steep section. I know got bounced around a little, but I think she should have enough in hand tucking now for the line. And yes, a clear win there for Veronica Eigner. And uh, mathematically, there was a chance that she could surrender her lead on the tour title on the the fight for the Crystal Globe for Giant Slalom, but uh, with that particular performance, she makes absolutely certain. Eigner wins this one, and with the 100 points, secures that Crystal Globe for the women's visually impaired 
giant slalom discipline. Fitzpatrick of Britain in second. And Eva Niku, for me, a very pleasant surprise. Third position. Nice podium for her and guide Dimitris Profensa to a uh, nice one there. Nice way there to wrap up their 2024 season. Votsa, Rexova and Choi make up the field. And as per the programme on the previous days, we have our quick podium ceremony right here in the finish area. And confirmation there. Eigner from Fitzpatrick from Eva Niku. And as we reckoned, a, a pretty dramatic race to wrap up this 2024 season. Fitzpatrick getting extra congratulations from the guy there to enjoy the competition. Eva Niku for Greece in third position. They're on your slow mo picks. And Mena Fitzpatrick. And guy Katie Guest on screen occupying second spot. But the Eigner sisters make it uh, a showcase finale to their 2024 season with a very strong showing there to take the final giant slalom competition here in Sela Nevea. After the first run and also in the lead of the giant slalom ranking, do you feel any additional pressure at the start? Um, before the race, we don't know um, that we win, but we make it. We give the best. Um, the weather was not easy the first time. The sun is shining. Now it's um, snowing and it's not easy, but we make the best and we are dry fast. And yes, we are, we are so happy to make the global from the cheers. Were you nervous at the start of the second run? Uh, no, I think not. Um, I think the, the slope conditions um, changed from icy to soft. It was very hard for the athletes and from the guides, but no, we are no nervous and we like to ski here. Same question of Deutsch. Was ihr ein bisschen uh, ja, nervös oder fühlt ihr ein bisschen Druck am Start? Um, ja, durch den, nach dem ersten Durchgang schon ein bisschen, da die Zeit sehr knapp war, aber wir haben das Beste versucht. Für mich ist es gut, dass ich nicht allzu nervös werde, da ich sonst viel zu viel mit dem Kopf fahre. Und daher noch ein bisschen blöd mit der Lisi am Start rede, aber das tut uns gut und ich glaube, das hat man im zweiten gesehen. Ja, genau. Also die, die Situation hier, also man ist vom Eisigen ins, ins Softe. Ähm, die Gegebenheiten sind halt für den Athleten und für den Guide sehr schwer. Aber wir haben unser Bestes dann. Nervös waren wir so eigentlich nicht, ähm, weil wir lieben es hier Ski, Ski zu fahren. Gratulation, vielen Dank. Okay. Well, we're straight back underway. Apologies, uh, not sure if you once lost your picture at home, but uh, crossing the line is uh, Shane Vaspi, the first of the standing women's category. Get a quick look back at her push out of the start, but uh, that's 2.23.19, the race pace for this women's second run. We're into the standing division now. We're sitting, we'll follow this with the sitting category and uh, 10 athletes back from the first round. Everybody successfully keep competing the first half of the competition in this particular category. Oh, well, Ali Johnson, that's a shame for the American youngster. She goes down pretty hard there. And... Uh, yeah, that's disappointing, as I say, for Ali, but uh, she's really on the comeback. She's had a, a really strong season, and it's been a, a long comeback for her from really nasty injury she sustained in 2020, a tibia and fibula fracture, which uh, slowed her progress. But 
She's got uh, many long years of competitive skiing ahead of her. I am sure uh, she'll be back home to do some further work in the summer months. She spends her time as a therapeutic horse riding instructor, so keeping the wits sharp and the body in condition out there riding around in the mountains of Colorado. So back at the top, we have a little delay. Ami Hondo of the Japanese ski team will be next up. She's waiting in the start gate. There's Marie Boucher of the French team who uh, sits third after the first run. But uh, back with the uh, live action here. Ami Hondo about to push out of the gate. She goes mentioning Marie Boucher, she has the same classification, uh, medical assessment, functional assessment as, as Marie Boucher. So uh, they both ski with 682, uh, LW682 classification. So the factoring system, which either, which modifies the clock time to level out the differences of abilities and differences of impairments, um, that really doesn't come into play for them. So, another skier displaying, I would say, a, a more solid approach than in the first run. Hondo making good progress on this top section and growing her advantage as she passes the split time. You see that little green graphic on the bottom right hand corner of your scheme, minus 5.77. Has she managed to stretch that at all over the line? Yes, she has, is the answer. 8.40 now opens up uh, quite a gap between her and her young Israeli skier, who was first to go, Shane Vaspi. So Hondo for Japan is our new leader. Uh, Bar Joe, our leader on the tour and uh, our leader from the first run, looking very, very relaxed in the start area. Croatia now, the only competitor from Croatia in this final giant slalom. Lucia Smitisko. Ooh, having a bit of trouble on that blue gate. There's a double. Uh, a blue red double gate just before it which sends the athletes really quickly across to the left hand side of the piece and then that next blue gate brings them way back to the right again so we've been seeing these last few days it is one of the characteristics of this hill it's definitely a, a bit of left foot bias there's more work to be done on the left foot than uh, on the right foot there's another one of those turns all the way around that blue and then back onto the fall line where the rhythm is evenly spaced or the gates are evenly spaced to set a even rhythm left to right. Uh, now here comes the line. 213 98 just keeps it under the 214 mark but takes the lead and uh, sets herself up for the moment in the leader's enclosure. And the first of the Austrians in the standing division. She'll have taken confidence and spirit from having watched the Eigner sisters take their victory a moment ago in the women's visually impaired category. Eva Marie Jochel, she has a 0.27 second advantage over our current leader, Smetisko. So far, so good. No major problems on this top part. Here comes the split time at this blue gate. And 0.34, well, hanging on. It's 
smooth turns through the midsection. Don't know if she's bringing quite the same level of aggression to this run as uh, the Croatian who went down just before her. Let's see what the clock has to say about that. Yoho over the line. Yeah, she drops to third place. Just let the advantage slide away and then a bit more besides. So our uh, leaderboard looks like this. Croatia from Japan, from Austria. That's Lucia Smitisko of Croatia in first and Ami Hondo for Japan. Canadian team looking very relaxed up there. That was Michaela Gosselin. But right now, Claire Petit is on course for the Netherlands. Uh, Gosselin will be next up. Petit uh, is the only LW skier, LW2 skier rather, in the Netherlands team these days. She too looking to try to move things up a gear, attacking, skiing, and grows her advantage from the first run. Drops a little bit low, and this is a tough gate. It's on her better side though, so that helps her a little. This one, however, on the weaker side, standing on the little toe, going around those left-hand curves. You're at more of a mechanical disadvantage. She's made it to the line, though. What's the time look like? Well, 2.12.53. 2.12.53, and that's your new leading time here in Sela Nevea. This is this uh, tough red gate which got really bumpy in this area in the first round, but so far looks uh, looks to be remaining quite smooth. Now here's Canada's Michaela Gosla. 1.59 her advantage over her new leader Claire Petit. a little bit of help from our factoring 96.36 just to try to balance but 0 0.80 now only the advantage she's let some time slip away from her So the last of the steeper, turnier gates. So now she's into the top position. She goes for the line. Clock ticks on. Ah, yeah. She's in there by quite a chunk of time. 2.21, the gap she's opened out now between herself and the Netherlands, Claire Petit. Croatia's Lucia Smitisko now down to third. And the first of the French competitors we've seen this afternoon, we've got Marie Boucher on course. Charging up this one. Boucher is sitting third after the first run. Relatively speaking, she is in the chase. 2.12. But she's uh, just a little under a second behind Anna Maria Rieder, who sits in second from the first run. So Boucher here trying to pressure the German, but also trying to maximise her chance of staying on the podium. 
Very smooth turns, very strong skiing from Marie on these closing gates. Good momentum for this final short flat. And leaderboard I know will change here. Minus 6.18 says the graphic. That's very, very quick indeed. Mission accomplished there for Marie Bochet, your new leader from the French ski team. Now, here's uh, Anna Maria Reader, who we were mentioning a moment ago. Second place in the first run, so looking for. Looking uh, to improve on her previous couple of results here in Selenovia. Twice second. Remember, we've had a couple of giant slams already in the last week. Last Tuesday, the first of those, and then on Thursday, a second giant slalom. And this third one has been rescheduled from last week, where we should have been just across the border in Kranska Gora. But unfortunately, Kranska Gora also suffering from very mild temperatures and a lack of snow. Reader, to my eye, skiing very strongly, looks to be giving it, I've found more energy for the second run than she had in the first, so Marie Boucher may be in trouble here. 2.07, and it's a green light for the German skier at the split point. Oh, a little skid on that red gate, which is now, as we expected, beginning to get a bit bumpy. Tucks in for the line, runs it straight across, but hangs on to the advantage. 2.62, in fact, and uh, your new best time for the second run is 201.52. This is where she got bounced around a bit on this next red gate. These big washboard ruts are just where the skier is trying to make the transition from left foot to right foot. Let's see how a uh, standout star of this women's standing season has has uh, gotten herself prepared. Emma Arjo, as usual, foot on the gas right from the get-go. Just a little on the tails on the entry to that blue. Had to make a bit of an adjustment and now fighting hard with the line but keeping good pace, I would think. Split time, what does it give her? 1.50. So the lead is there, but she's right pretty close to the limit. You would imagine she might want to just throttle back ever so slightly, but looks to be just content to power on. Here come the last few tricky turns over the bumps with no problem whatsoever. Well, don't think anything's going to stop the young Swede now. Eba makes it three giant slalom wins in a row here in Selenavia and wraps up her giant slalom season tour very well indeed. She will take not only those 100 points from today and the accolade of winning this giant slalom, she also takes home a small crystal globe today from... Uh, the giant slalom season standing so a great effort by her and another very well deserved victory well it was a bit of a shootout there for the top three but confirmation is sweden from germany from france eva arjo taking the top spot anna maria reader for germany goes second in france's marie Bochet slots into third Gosselin for Canada and Claire Petit for the Netherlands making up the top five. And uh, we just get prepared here for the podium. As the young Swede gets her uh, ski off to keep her equipment suppliers happy and get their pictures in the news as well. Marie Boucher, that's great. First to congratulate Ebba. Anna Maria Reader there, still catching her breath from her 
run. Her skiing has gone from strength to strength this season. She'll be second in the tour standings as well. So uh, that's been a really, really solid and productive season for her. And the podium reflects the standings for the giant slalom globe with uh, Marie Boucher on your screen right now, taking third place for the end of season ranking. Marge are showing a very clean series of turns here through the bumpy lower part of the course. Let's see what she says about her run. And it's also a very emotional run for you today. Can you explain us how you feel? I feel so relieved. Uh, it's been a hard week for the leg and I'm, oh, I'm so proud now. I've been so nervous today. And it's so good to be so lucky that you're so good. It's also a step closer to the overall ranking globe. What do you think about that? What does this represent for you? Everything. I mean, I think I secured it. So that's, it's never happened before. And I'm really, really proud. I'm really, really proud. I think it's a good thing. So it's a good thing. It's a good thing. It's a good thing. Thank you. Congratulations. Well, it's been a season of incredibly hard work for the young Swede, but now the emotion's coming to the surface, and uh, that's beautiful to see. And great words from her. There's nothing wrong with saying that you're proud of your own efforts when she's achieved results as she has all season long. So we're straight away into the women's sitting category here, and Laurie Stevens getting us underway again. She opened the proceedings this morning, and uh, same again here in the second and final run. Around this sweeping red blue double gate past the split. Stops the clock at 148.06. Her line dro dropping just ever so slightly low on a few of these turns. But the action from turn to turn is smooth. Consistent, steady, that's very important in giant slalom. Particularly for the sit skiers, because as we've seen the last couple of days, it gets rough down on this lower part. And Stevens gets bounced coming into this final pitch and the, that ripple, that roller rut between the blue and the red, throwing her in the air again. She's ridden out well. Keeps driving his shoulders forward, pulls the riggers in as she crosses the line. Total time for Laurie Stevens, 2.24.35. Team USA safely in the finish area. Barbara van Bergen, here she is. Next up for the Netherlands team. Both Stevens and uh, van Bergen, very experienced skiers. Very Solid performances from them at the last three Winter Paralympic Games. In contrast, uh, the young lady who's sitting in the start waiting to take her chance is a relative rookie. We'll see how she deals with the pressure. Well, Van Bergen cruising this one, carrying real good pace, has to slam the brakes on though at the exit from the double to keep herself on track. Opens up. Another few seconds to her lead. And again, same tactic as we saw up the top, picking the line with precision, finding a smooth ride from turn to turn consequently. consequently. Uh, now here, this is the area where she needs to go high for this red gate. Again, precision there in the scheme by Barbara von Bergen. She knew exactly where she would expect to find those ruts and holes skis safely around them crosses the line and yeah takes the lead no surprise no disasters on the way down read the course extremely well and uh netherlands now lead from team usa quick look at this bumpy section the deepest part of the hole is just down to our left so she steered her way out of trouble very nicely there Audrey Seco Pascual on course. Spanish skier has had pocketed a 
couple of podiums here. Oh no! Well, we wondered if she could soak up the pressure. What a shame! That could have been, it could have been her first World Cup victory. But Audrey Pascual Seco is down and out of this one. Excuse me, she had a win already in Giant Slalom and Vesona on our back uh, last, yeah, last season. But uh, all part of the learning process. Just went in a bit too straight on the blue of that blue-red double and had too much of a turn to make when she got to the red gate. Not enough space. Drops her shoulders in deep to the left of the curve and the ski breaks away as a result so she's a dnf only to make it across the line in this second race but the victory goes to the netherlands with barbara von bergen and second place to team usa's laurie stevens Well, comparing notes and uh, giving each other team support. Barbara von Bergen sounded a little disappointed there, but uh, sounds like Claire Petit. <laughs> yeah, we're listening in, girls. Careful what you say. Claire Petit giving her a bit of consolation, but uh, I have to say the Dutch women's programme has uh, come on leaps and bounds with uh, the addition of Claire Petit, some new blood on the team. Laurie Stevens there, pushing into the podium area. Not the first time she's done that. And uh, a quick look at the podium. Van Bergen takes the victory. 100 World Cup points for her. The Globe title, just for everybody's reference, uh, the notable absentee here is Annalena Forster of Germany. She's got a bit of a cold today, but she al had already done enough work this season to secure the Giant Slalom Globe title. So, Annalena, if you're sitting watching this in the team hotel, Hopefully you'll be feeling better and we'll see you back in action for tomorrow's Super G. But from all of us at FIS TV, big congratulations to you for taking the giant slalom crystal globe home to Germany. Solid runs, even in those very changing conditions, how did you feel on the slope? Well, um, actually on this one and first one as well, I felt really good. But on the first run, I made a big mistake and then was behind Audrey. But she did a fabulous job. Um, so I was hoping to battle it out for the second run, but unfortunately CG DNF, but um, I managed to get through and felt good. Same question, uh, answer in Dutch. Uh, yeah, we have two good runs done. Uh, in the first run we had a big fout gemaakt and there after Audrey came. I had it graag in the second run natuurlijk uitge but helaas is helaas uh, not finished. Uh, but my gevoel was wel heel goed over the second run, so that's heel fijn. Thank you, congratulations. Hmm, great words. Yeah, it's the comp they're all in it for the competition. It's really interesting to hear that uh, Barbara van Bergen giving us a insight into the mindset of these elite competitors from the world of Paralympics. Well, that concludes the women's competition for today. And we're straight away, we get going with the men, Miroslav Haraus. Pushing strongly out of the start here in the men's visually impaired category. Maros Hudek ahead of him in the yellow suit, guiding him best he can through these top gates. They're not so challenging, tactically a little bit because there's a double gate there higher up that falls away to the skier's right. Oh, Harris still running late, has to drift wide. He's not going to make the next gate. Uh, he's not, he hasn't crashed, but 
he had kind of lost contact with the guide and because he had run straight in the previous couple of gates, when he got to this point, there just wasn't room to go from the red across to the blue, which was way across to his left. So he decides to let uh, discretion be the better part of valor and puts the brakes on. And that's our first does not finish. Uh, in the second run of the men's competition. So let's wait and see what Alexander Rowan, he should be next up. But number 27, that's Korea's Mingyu Huang in the red suit. There's uh, Rowan there. His guide, Jeremiah will get getting ready. And here comes the five second countdown. And off they go. Nice and close together here. Jeremiah's calling the banana. That's the one we mentioned just before he came. Ooh, it wasn't a banana. He skied the banana so well. He was carrying way more pace than he thought he would have been when he went into the next blue. But hangs on there by the skin of his teeth, right on the back of his skis. But they're right back to the job of putting the power onto the skis. Oh, again, he gets squashed very badly. He needs to try to stand, get the upper body over the outside ski a little more strongly to make that outside ski carve cleanly and more securely, to keep him safely online. This is going to be especially important in the entry to this coming red gate. The guide has gotten on absolutely the perfect spot there around the top of those rollers. Great job there by Yeramak Yasvilka. Alexander Rowan, now we have someone over the line in the VI division. He sets the race pace for now, 159.38 it is. This is where he had the really lucky escape at the top. Just managed to stay upright. But yeah, a really good study there into how the guide and athlete have to work in, in perfect synchronicity. young men up the top there who look very familiar. That's uh, Johannes Eigner. He'll be taking confidence from his sister Elizabeth and Veronica's performance a moment or two ago in the women's VI. But uh, we're on course here with the French. The French coaches are the most vocal from the sidelines. So plenty of encouragement for their guys and girls. Roy Picard doing a great job in his role as a guide here. Just a little check every other turn. But look, they're very, very close together. Two or three, four ski lengths or so at the moment. So that allows Iasanth to just loosen up and get on with the job of charging against the hill right on the fall line for as long as possible through these tricky turns and now out onto the final flat part really good skiing on this lower section by Saint de la place and yeah opens a big lead up 5.11 seconds his advantage is uh, the winner or leader race pace at the moment now is 154.27 Took the risky line through the bumps there, but he was well balanced over the ski, so nice work. Korea next in the gate as they compose themselves. Mingyu Huang and this guy Jun Yong Kim. They're on course. These first two or three gates are important. Tricky for the VIs. The first four or five gates are set very straight and then they're into this big, long change of rhythm. This big, long right foot turn and then quickly back into uh, a more upbeat tempo of turns on the next section. So that's a, a challenge for the guide and athlete to stay well connected. Good communication. Um, These guys are pushing it right to the limit as well. Mingyu 
once or twice, almost losing the outside ski. If you want to move up the rankings, you've got to take risks, and these guys certainly taking plenty of those. Great skiing as well to back up the risky approach. Into the tuck quickly before the line. Try to break the air over the shoulders and limit the drag from the air. Into the lead they go. 0.54 of a second there, advantage over the French pair. You can hear in the background, they're delighted with their efforts. Really stepped it up a level. <laughs> Great work, guys. Well done. So, we're into the top four. Golas, there they are. Or there he is with his guide, uh, Kaspar Valas. Launching out of the start. Big aggressive push from both those guys. Now here comes the rhythm, first rhythm. Change around. They go in this turn here. Oh, they, they've read that beautifully. Really close to the following three, four gates now. And this is a, this is a quick midsection. There's the second double gate. Around the big curve into the gully they go. Split time, a green light, surely. 1.26 it is. We'll Golas in command here. Nice rhythmical action, nice transition. Pole plant action, helping him stabilise himself as he switches from one foot to the other. And the work from this pair has been spot on through the, the every single turn here. They've stayed in rhythm, stayed well in contact with each other. Now they go at the line and surely, yes, the leaderboard changes again and uh, they open up a big gap between themselves and Mingyu Huang, Mikhail Golas, your new leader here as we move into the final three in this men's visually impaired category. Now, the tour leader, I didn't expect to see these lads starting anywhere other than in the final position in the second run, but could only manage third in the first run. Into the countdown and off they go. No calculations necessary in terms of the crystal globe for the giant slalom. This pair have it in the bag and they've been dominant all the way through the season. And there's a good example of exactly why. Look how close and how tight they are, almost mirroring one another. And that synchronicity, that connection that the guide and athlete at this pair are displaying. Um, is really what allows the pairing to move more quickly and more quickly as they get working down the course. So, on to the final short but bumpy pitch. No major problems there. Johannes pushing forward, keeping the front part of the ski stable. Into the lead there, 0 0.80 now. It's a question of who can challenge them and by how much. There's a bit of a gap between uh, Canada's Kai Eriksson and Eigner. Eriksson will be up next. The gap is uh, 0.96. And after a run like that from Eigner and Haberle, I think Eriksson will know if they want another win here. He's going to have to pull out all the stops. Ian Guide Sierra Smith, they had the most amazing second run charge. Oh, big mistake there from Cali as he tried to push out the start. His pole slipped off, the left pole slipped off the mat that he's meant to get some grip on. Let's hope it doesn't disturb his concentration. Can only lose maybe a tenth at most in the start, but oh, what's going wrong here? It certainly does seem to have rattled him. Not skiing with his usual precision and consistency. Really not cleanly over the outside ski. And the advantage, well, it's more than halved. Only 0.2 of a second they have now. 
This is a bit more settled, a bit more like we saw from them the last few days. Ericsson, as I was saying, had the most amazing second run charge in Friday's slalom to take a victory. Sierra Smith, this guy, giving him calm instruction there over the headset. Need to dig deep in these closing curves. They've done enough. Oh, that was a close run thing, though. Cali Eriksson, that mistake at the top uh, could have cost them the race. But uh, we have a new leader. Eriksson anxious to know how they'd done. There's the scramble out of the start gate. Nice recovery, but look, you can see he's, he's not, he's rushing the next turns there and trying to find his outside ski, so important lesson to be learnt there for future races, I would say. Anyway, here comes the final competitor here in the men's visually impaired scheme, but Giacomo Bertagnoli. Let's see what he can do. He has 0.91 of a second over Ericsson. They'll know that Ericsson had a bit of a scramble, as I've been calling it, in the start. But uh, they also know that the Eigners have put down, or that Johannes Eigner and Haberley, his guide, have put down a cracker of a run as well. So I think that's translated into this sense of urgency that we're seeing on the screen here. Bertinoli seems to have recovered his energies after being ill for a couple of days. And look, they've grown their advantage by, well, almost 0 0.5, 0 0.6 of a second. They're through the lower turns, which caused some problems for the earlier skiers. But surely here we go, it's a victory for Bertinoli. And uh, the most impressive part is the lead they stretched out. What's that? 0.7 of a second quicker than anyone else in that second run. Really strong run for them to take the victory in this final giant slalom for the men's visually impaired skiers. And finally, we see the Italian coaches smiling a little. Quick look at the slow mo. And look at uh, Berta Newley getting back to his winning ways. That's really good that he's recovering. Hopefully, we'll see him in tomorrow's super giant slalom as well. There's the standings confirmed. Berta Newley from Ericsson from Eigner. And uh, the Crystal Globe, don't forget, goes to Eigner. He has done more than enough this season to secure uh, that particular title. He should end up with a grand total of 600 World Cup points. Uh, he's added, his, added 60 from his third place today. So uh, as the boys get themselves lined up for the podium and standing men get ready to take their turn. We'll just get confirmation of the rankings one more time. Yeah, the Italian lads are all smiles. Big shout from the fans in the finish area. Italy from Canada from Austria. Our third place skiers from uh, the second run on screen, Kai Eriksson. We get one last look at that mix up at the start that uh, almost put him out of the race. But the look on his face in these closing turns show that uh, determination, determination got him through and earned him that second spot. Not enough though to challenge Giacomo Bertagnoli who Giacomo takes the victory. Andrea. Like two days before, you were in the lead after the first run, but this time you could defend the victory. Did you feel any pressure at the start? How did you manage the, the nerves? Oh no, today was the last GS. I just wanted to finish, so I, I pushed hard and, you know, I just wanted to get to the, to the bottom, to the end. Uh, I think we did a pretty good race. Of course, we can improve, but uh, I'm uh, super satisfied, and I think he he thinks the same. Yeah, yeah. Were you nervous? Uh, no, but uh, the the snow and the the, the race was uh, hard, but uh, we are the best. <laughs> and we win. Same question you can answer in Italian. Yeah. Uh, sì, oggi in realtà non c'era tanta pressione, 
eh, perché è l'ultima gara della stagione, la Coppa dei Giganti purtroppo eh, non, la possiamo non la potevamo vincere, quindi oggi abbiamo dato il tutto per tutto per almeno concludere questa stagione con un bel oro, cosa che abbiamo fatto, quindi riprenderemo l'anno prossimo ancora più carichi. Sì esatto, siamo contenti, ha tenuto duro eh, tutte e due le manche, era difficile però ce l'abbiamo fatta, ci accontentiamo di questa vittoria anche se non abbiamo portato a casa la generale ma il nostro sguardo è verso il futuro e quindi c'è ancora tanto da allenarci perché il livello sta aumentando sempre di più e noi vorremmo farci trovare pronti. Grazie, grazie, grazie bravo. Ciao. Well, well done guys, that's great to take a victory, the final in the GS of... Uh... GS tour of the season. Great to take that victory in home snow and turn it on for the local fans. Straight into the action here, Viverka for uh, Czech Republic. Apologies for misrepresenting him earlier today. He's almost at the line. We join him only 10 gates from home. And as uh, the first of the men's standing competitors. He gets himself safely across the line and sets the early pace at 2 minutes, 11.36 seconds. Quick course support there for Marcus Nilsson Grasto from the Norwegian coaches. Uh, Spencer Wood pushes out for Team USA. Three Americans in the men's standing division. Spencer Wood, Patrick Haugen and young Jesse Keefe, the flying rookie, did very well in the first run, but let's uh, pay attention to Spencer Wood's run. He's uh, dropped some time by the looks of things. Doesn't look to have the same energy going on to the ski as he did in the first run and consequently drifting particularly on his weaker side, on these right foot turns, he seems to be getting pushed down the hill more than he was earlier to date. It's been a tough old week of ski racing here with the extra races scheduled to try to make up for some of those we lost earlier in the season. I think each and every one of the athletes feeling the pace. Spencer tucks in now. Team USA are across the line. Yeah, he let just a little bit too much slip away from him, I think, in the, particularly in the top turns. Smooth skiing on the closing gates, but uh, higher up seemed to uh, be where the time was lost. So, Czech Republic are leading the way ahead of Team USA, and uh, now we have Germany in the start gate. Leander Crest on course. Oh, just going down so heavily. These guys are made of pretty stern stuff. I think he'll be okay, but that was a heavy hit that Crest took. He was in. A little too hot to the gate following the double, the left foot is following the double turn. And it's bumpy on that low right in. And just as he goes in here, the ski is all over the place. And that uh, that's definitely not an equipment failure. That ski did need to come off. There was no way it was staying on. He looks to be okay though. The equipment has done its work and he should be able to click back in and ski himself safely down. So we've got a little pause here. That's the small band of spectators down the bottom. That's the Austrian crew from just across the border. I recognise a few faces there. Um, but uh, the damp weather certainly not spoiling the party for them. Norway will be up next. And just get to the end of this extended interval that the starter has put in to make sure uh, Leander Crest can get safely off the hill. I should only be 10 seconds now for Marcus Nilsson Grasto.
He's out and away. Difficult visibility. The snows, kind of this wet snow, has started to get heavier again. This is how it was about you know, almost an hour ago when we started the women's competition. And yeah, the clouds are definitely coming lower when we see the wide shot. So hope it's not uh, affecting the goggles too badly for Marcus. He keeps the green light on, that's the main thing. 2.87, a healthy buffer over Viverka, who's our current leader. 16 athletes back for the second run in the stand-up division for the guys. Marcus doing a good job here through the bumpy lower turns. Now in sight of the line, but he's missed the last gate. Oh, no, just let it run a little bit too much. Oh, you'd think that's impossible to do, but I can assure you it happens fairly regularly. Just a slightest lack of concentration right at the end of the run. He needed a little more direction from the blue gate to be able to safely make the following red and hadn't taken quite enough of a direction change. So we have uh, two out of the four athletes so far in this sector that uh, haven't made it in one way or another. Let's see what Davide Bendotti can do. Second of... Uh, Five LW2 athletes in the second run. Nice and smoothly around that long banana gate, but then that blue is on the side that is less favourable for him, but seems to have got the measure of it and has uh, grown his advantage. Turns out getting a pretty direct line as well. Cutting the line can save time, but it also increases the forces right at the gate and under the gate. So it's a, a riskier way to travel, and that ultimately is the challenge for the alpine skiers, is just getting that blend perfectly right. Safely around that tricky last gate, and Bendotti stretches his lead, secures that. Uh, lead for himself. He's 6.32 ahead of the rest of the field. We'll have to see if it's going to be good enough to help him move up the rankings. But I was talking about risk taking. You can see there in the slow-mo he was pushing it right to the limit. Nice work. <laughs> and yeah, it goes without saying that that's brutally hard doing that on one leg. Next of the Americans here, Patrick Halgern. Two an LW two skier. Good work so far. Really good work, in fact. Ski could maybe be driven a little more, a little bit more of a load to help him stay on top of things, but. Um, Another summer season in the gym will help him work on that. And it's enough to get ahead of Bendotti at this point, but he ran very straight. Now has to make a big adjustment. That red to blue and next red. Those previous couple of turns, he was definitely taking the long way around to be able to stay on the track. Giant slalom, it's the ultimate test of technique, but also tactics as well. You need to be able to pick your line, just match it to your ability as best you can. Algren, has he done enough to hang on here? Yes. 1.48. He takes the lead for the American team. <laughs> the waves are pumping. The waves are pumping. I'm going to try to remember that phrase. <laughs> Ciao, Patrick. <laughs> well, you heard it from the horse's mouth. It's all very well me trying to explain on the screen here. Um, 
how difficult that is, but you heard it right from the racers themselves there. Well, Rachbauer up next for the Austrian team. This is uh, looking for to get his first World Cup points from this visit to the Italian Alps. Battle with the conditions as well. The snow has just gotten much heavier in the last minute or so. Ultimately, I don't think it will trouble the organisers. We should be able to complete this one, but it definitely adds an extra element of challenge for the skiers. Rachbauer over those waves. Most like a staircase to me than waves, but uh, he looks to be safely down from here. Rachbauer trying to overhaul Halgrim, but he can't. It's close, 0.54 of a second. Not quite enough for the Austrian to prevent Halgrim from hanging on to the lead. Uh, up close look at Patrick Rachbauer as he tries, Manuel Rachbauer rather as he uh, tries to get his breath back. Well, the Americans lead, but they're not done yet. This is uh, the last of their guys in the stand up category. Jesse Keefe. Conditions here are a far cry from what he's used to in Sun Valley, I can assure you of that different snow than we're used to seeing in the high mountains of the Rockies, but uh, he's adapting well to this. This is uh, a real flyer of a run. He's an LW4. Now that, remember, he's skiing with a prosthetic limb, so um, his factor, believe it or not, doesn't really give him much help. Just a shade under 3% off his real time. So that's why you're seeing such a sense of urgency from this rising star from the American team. We're going to see the leaderboard change, but look, the gap went from 0.93 at the split to 2.03. So he took 1.1 seconds out of everybody else in the closing half of this run. A real talent for the future, but right now, He's the, on the top slot. Jesse Keefe leads the way for Team USA. Some pretty serious competition still to come. Though I think his time at the top may be somewhat limited, but it'll be a question to see if he can overhaul some of the guys who he's a little bit close, closer to after the first one. Glitz, now the first of those. The trails, trail has an advantage rather over Jesse Keefe, our new leader of 0.53 of a second from the first run. Stroked a little low on that first steep section. <clears throat> Keeps it steady though through the gully. Now needs to get out far to his left and then be quick from edge to edge in these following few turns. The distance between the gate decreases, the visibility decreasing as well obviously as he takes a wipe and desperation out of his goggles. This really is the worst stuff to be falling from the sky. It's actually easier to see through raindrops on the goggles than these chunks of sleet that are coming down. He looks he should be okay from here though. Let's see, has he done enough? Oh no, these drops back to fourth place. That's a measure of the difficulty that he's facing, but I think it's also more a measure of how strong that run of Jesse Keefe's was. Young American really threw caution to the wind. Glutz now line management a little bit difficult there and it's clear that he was having trouble with his visibility.
Well, Austria again on course, in the shape of the very experienced Marcus Sacher. Marcus uh, has this weakness on the right side of his body, so these turns where he's trying to get round to the left are less favourable for him. But uh, now with an awful lot of experience at the highest level, he uh, can mix it with the best in uh, practically every discipline. Two six hangs on to the lead at the halfway split. But his advantage has been well, more than halved. Keeps the work rate up. Negotiates the. Those big waves on those final three serious turns now heading for the line. Soccer, has he done enough? Oh no, second place it is, but again, look at the gap 1.29 behind. His total time 2.02.82. Jesse Keefe still leads with 2.01.53. The young American. I'd like to see how he's reacting to this in the finish here. Sure he can't believe his luck. It's a well-earned position he sits in right now, so uh, the wait becomes ever anxious for Keith. Austria still have another ace in the hole here in the shape of Tommy Grocher. Last chance for Austria here. Tommy, as usual. Getting stuck into these top gates straight away around that, oh, around that long double turn, which was on his good side, but then as he tried to make the switch to go into the tight right-hander following the double, the outside, or the ski just got whipped away from him in an instant. He went down really hard and the ski reacted very, very quickly. I hope he's okay. It's taking a bit of time here to compose himself. There will be a delay for sure while we make sure that uh, he's not injured or that we get him safely to the side of the hill. Arthur Boucher, our leader from the first run, keeping himself cool and composed. He has a feral buffer over his teammate Jordan Broisin, who sits second from the first. That buffer, 2.07 seconds. And uh, and another 4-2 to that man, Aaron Lindstrom, and then, believe it or not, another two French skiers there. So uh, four Frenchmen in the final five here in this giant slalom competition. There's Oscar Burnham right on cue, his teammate Jules Segers goes just after him. But here's the standings as they are at the moment while we uh, have a slightly anxious wait to see how Tommy Grocher is getting on up there after a very big crash up on the top section of the course. And the snow continues to fall. It's getting a bit more like snow. It seems to be cooling down a little bit. As it cools down, the precipitation seems to be getting heavier. So, as I've said already, that really won't help anybody up there. <laughs> Meanwhile, USA, number one. at the bottom of the hill, <laughs> the boys are getting a celebratory move. Mood. Full gas. Full gas, USA. Full gas, USA. <laughs> Team USA in great spirit, and uh, quite rightly so. Jesse Keefe there. Up and coming rising star leading the way. Uh, we've got five to go, but we have a delay. Different atmosphere. That's a nice couple of shots there. The contrast between the atmosphere in the hospitality tent or the recovery tent down in the finish area versus the start tent where things are slightly tenser. Marcus Soccer is all smiles. He's uh, met up with family and friends who have made the trek across from Kerton to give him support. Uh, 
there's a young Norwegian who too didn't make it. There's Jesse Keefe, no long wonder he's looking delighted with his efforts. So we're seeing them, the remaining five cards to be dealt here. Four of them are French. And uh, the French coming on strong in the closing races. Just got better and better through this uh, the last week of competition. We put a lot of snow in one time. All of a sudden. It was sunny and now... Yeah. Almost like aura weather. You remember aura when we were there? It was like. It well, as usual, if you're a little bit short of a conversation topic when you're out in the mountain, talk about the weather. I have to say, just right on cue, Friuli, Venezia, Giulia, the, the region uh, has done a fantastic job of supporting these World Cup finals and putting together a great race crew, the local organising committee, uh, assembled by the Sport for All Hans Erlacher team have uh, done a great job under very, very difficult circumstances. If things go according to plan, they will pull off a Super G for us tomorrow. That will be the final race of the season, final World Cup race of the para-alpine season. But I have to send my congratulations to them. And I'm sure all the athletes would agree that uh, it's been tough here, uh, down in the sector of the Alps. So, so warm, so little snowpack remaining. Uh, and that ultimately has meant we have had to lose the final downhill of the year. But as I say, the speed kings and queens will get a run out tomorrow, if all being well, as long as the snow holds off a little. Uh, we'll certainly be struggling to run a Super G if the weather's like this tomorrow, but uh, there it is clear spells in the forecast. So uh, we'll watch very Closely to see uh, what tomorrow morning brings. Yeah, slide, slide before because now it's powder. No, 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 it's powder. <laughs> Well, as everybody relaxes at the finish, we're all uh, waiting slightly anxiously just to see what's happened to Thomas Grocher. I think I'm going to see him skiing down somewhere shortly. I think he's not uh, sustained an injury high up on the course. You're getting caught in 4K here. Jesse Keith's got a. I don't know. <laughs> That's a right young Italian. The hairstyle deceived me there, but. Uh, a little impromptu, unofficial interview there with the Italians in the Finnish tent. And still the snow continues to fall. Well, let's hope we can get things underway quickly because as well as interrupting the visibility, this soft snow on top of the, on the race line doesn't really help the later runners. And we do have a bit of a shootout remaining here. The remaining five skiers are separated by only 3.19 seconds. So... Sagers from Burnham, from Lindstrom, from Brozza, from our first run leader, Artur Boucher. We'll be hoping we can get things moving as quickly as we possibly can. Afternoon, everybody. Everybody looked very relaxed there now that their race is over. Good news, um, glad to see, is that the course crew are still working. I wouldn't really expect anything else. They're slipping this new snow off of the race line so that it doesn't cause t 
too many or any problems for these remaining five stand-up guys. We've got uh, 14 sit skiers as well to run to complete today's proceedings. Sharing a few words with some of the his competitors. The French team keeping things nice and chilled out up in the start area. It's important uh, just to conserve the emotional energy as much as anything else in situations like this. It's, it's a very important role of the start coach just to help his athletes stay calm but stay ready at the same time because things can change quickly. If uh, there's a course, a bit of extra course preparation work or if the athlete needs a bit of help to get off the hill, then uh, we need to allow all of that to happen but then things as I say can change very quickly and it can be time to be back on deck with only a minute or so's warning for those skiers who are waiting to take their turn. As I say it's a different atmosphere down at the finish where everybody's very chilled out and smiling happily. Marcus Sarker he currently sits second behind America's Jesse Keefe. Well, the snow continues to fall, but as I mentioned earlier, there are clearer spells predicted for tomorrow, and according to the forecast I'm working from anyway, the weather track is rolling through just, uh, just as it was predicted to with this snowfall perhaps arriving an hour or two early th earlier than we'd anticipated. It's snowing heavily, you know, and as I say, it's got colder, start of the competition just on the hour, an hour and 20 minutes ago. The, uh, it was falling pretty much as rain, but now as the temperature drops, it's turning to snow. But uh, the main thing I hope is that it does roll through. We'll be okay to get today's giant slam completed, but we really don't want too much wet snow falling overnight, or certainly not coming down while our planned Super G is underway tomorrow. Ça va pas faire beaucoup. Non, mais c'est pour le. Non, mais c'est pour le. Non, mais c'est pour le. 
allora qua li mettete subito qua di fianco ok laterale no ma la moglie dovrà mettere un uomo Looks like the start referee and his assistants are uh, using this uh, gap has created an opportunity to do a little bit of work to the start gate. Oh. And send, uh, what they're doing is they're sending the course slippers out with very specific instructions to try to move this heavy wet snow that's been falling in the almost 20 minutes now that we've been uh, waiting to get things back underway. And the French all lining up for a look. Uh, <laughs> I was just about to say, uh, Aaron Lindstrom is probably feeling a little bit left out there. Looks like the Swedes don't have a start coach. So he's up there with the, the French athletes and the coaches. And yeah, well, I'm glad he's getting off the hill, but disappointed at the same time that it looks like Thomas Grocher has been taken down in the sledge. So that's really not the outcome we've been hoping for. Let's hope it's nothing too serious for Tommy. So, um, as I say, the good news is that he's in safe hands of the ski patrol and will be taken down for medical assessment. And you know, the kids, some of the kids from the local ski club here that are out on course slipping duties you can see, if you look closely at their skis, how much snow has built up already in this 20, 20 30 minutes since it got heavy and uh, it could pose problems for the later runners. As I say, we've got a lot of athletes to get down the hill yet. We've got 14 sit skiers plus the five standing guys who are waiting at the top. And, uh, we really don't want the race to be spoiled by the conditions getting so bad that uh, we have a lot of DNFs from the later runners. Still, skiing being one of the ultimate outdoor sports, uh, we have to take the rough with the smooth. Getting some uh, extra dye onto the course as well. That's going to be of great assistance to everybody. The dye It's not to show the guys the way, it's to help create a bit of definition bit of light dark definition to help the skiers where, see where the terrain really is going because as the clouds are coming lower and the snowfall is getting heavier the light has faded and there's now a distinct lack of definition between light and dark on the snow which simply put means you can't see where the bumps are and as we were seeing and hearing from some of the athletes it's it's already pretty choppy down there. So uh, Mother Nature conspiring against us somewhat here. But um, I would anticipate that we should be getting things underway in not, certainly not too long from now. Turboshi there having a look from the start position. Certainly looks relaxed. I'm big, uh, big smile on his face, young Arthur. For me, I don't, I don't have the same stability like this. So for me, it's more better with a balance, go like with a split machine. And dips, and dips also. What? A dips also? Yeah, dips. Yeah. And uh, do you, how do you do that? Uh, with a chain? With a chain, yeah. And you uh, so yeah, gentlemen yeah. for listening in to uh, Oscar and Aaron there the comparing dry land training, fitness training notes. They are uh, their impairments or classification very similar, they're both six eight twos. 
So, uh, it's a kind of, to be fair, uh, fairly, uh, a fair representation of how the teams work together. That little conversation you were hearing there, everybody on this tour is in the mindset of helping each other out. Certainly, my own experience as a coach on the tour is uh, a great great place to work as a coach and such easy collaborations to be found with other national teams because of that atmosphere of uh, everybody wanting to do the best for their for the athletes, whether it's their own athletes from their own national team or those who might be viewed in other ways as competitors. Well, it does look like we are about to get going. Looks like the start ref has given the athletes their standby orders. And uh, when we get things underway, that man on screen, Jules Segers, he will be first to go. Leg rub from the start coach and physio, just to activate the muscles, waking up the circulation. So Jules Segers, he's the the jeune espoir, I think it's fair to say, the young hopeful on the French team. Hails from Léger. Very well known ski resort on the way up towards Chamonix, up in the uh, Haute Doesn't seem to be getting affected by the delay. Looks cool and calm, but also collected. Looks ready to go. So after, well, almost half an hour of a delay, it really does look like we're about to get things underway. The jury radio's just been checked there. The jury members on the course, cleaning the course from bottom to top. That allows the start referee to check the athletes are ready. And then on the next interval, the clock will signify the countdown. You'll hear the beeps. First for a 10 second warning and then five counting down to zero from that five in the disciplines which start with the countdown. The athletes can go any time from the next beep. Jules Seger. Well, after the big delay, we're back underway. Seger's on course for the French team. Well, it's tough out there now you get a look at the whole hill. The light really has faded. The bumps are still there though. Now it's there completely impossible to see. So 19 years old, Jules Sager on course here. 21 years old, excuse me. He definitely has form in giant slalom. Even though I'm calling him an Espoir, that uh, his hopes have been Proven. He was a gold medalist in the Youth Paralympic Games in this discipline a couple of years ago. But now, different kettle of fish mixing it with the big guys. He does have an immensely strong team around him, though, to help him as he develops his skills and builds that competition experience. Uh, and I would say that after that long delay, this is a very composed and measured run by Segers, and it's enough for him to change the leaderboard. Jesse Keefe finally is knocked off the top perch, and he's down to second, Sacher in third. But the youngster, Jules Seger, gives us a wave as he has a quick check of his position and time. We'll watch him wait very closely as the remainder of his team come down to see how his result's going to end up. So, three more Frenchmen to go and one Swede. Four racers remain. First up, Oscar Burnham. Really getting stuck into this first few turns. Now, no help from the clock, remember? We were discussing his classification. He and the next skier who will follow Adam Lundstrom are 682 classified athletes. Mm. 
pushing it here. Really close to the gates. Trying to tweak the tails of the skis coming out of the turn just to get a little bit extra acceleration. Smooth through the bumpy parts though, that's a very important tactic I think that uh, will be one of the elements which determines who finally takes the lead here. Right now the lead though goes to Burnham. I think that simply means I can't see a thing. That wet stuff, especially at the bottom, the snow's almost rained down here. You can see there on his goggles all those blobs of rain adding to the difficulty here. So, four to go. Aaron Lindstrom gets a high five from his coach. So third place after the first run and uh, with Jordan Broza and Arthur Boucher ahead of him. I think uh, the only tactic for Lindstrom to employ is to try to go as hard as he can, make this run as clean as possible to try to put some kind of pressure on them to force an error. Right now, that game plan looks to be getting delivered very well. Gates where he can afford to go straight, he's clipping very heavily, knows that he needs to give a bit of respect, he seems to be giving them a bit of space. In straight here, over the final terrain break, and this last steep, bumpy section keeps that high level of attack here, driving forward. The advantage he did have over Burnham has gone at the split, but that was a strong lower section, I would say, and it's enough to put him into the lead. 0.85, the gap he has, he opens up or stretches out from the others. See his goggles, they're covered in sleet. So these are the turns that he really nailed on that final steep pitch, and it's bumpy there as well, so that attacking approach really seemed to work well for the young Swede. So two remain, Jordan Brassin. Big push, off he goes. It's one of only uh, two LW4 athletes, so those are the guys who have a lower limb amputation and ski with a prosthesis. He and Jesse Keith, both in the same category there. Jordan reading the terrain well. Finding a good smooth line round these turns. Keeps the work rate high. Keeps the green light on importantly. He's in a bit of trouble here though. Has to make an adjustment as he goes towards that red gate. Gets the line back, but that will have cost him a little, I think. Now, out of the bumpy turns and into these final flatter more open curves, last gate, and here comes the line. But couldn't overturn Lindstrom, but he's delighted with that. He guarantees himself a podium. And uh, France, with one man still in the start, looked to have a certainty of having two guys on the podium come the end of the race. Jordan Brossa not able to overtake the Swede, but putting himself solidly in second position for now with one man left standing at the top. He goes, young Artur Boucher about to launch. The red tour leader bib shows that he is in command of the tour so far at this point in the season. And uh, he's done enough already to uh, secure that globe. So just skiing to prove himself as uh, the number one giant slalom skier on the hill today in this men's standing category. Down through the fog he goes. That long delay doesn't seem to have affected his composure. The French team had strength in numbers there in the start, so that's, I think, helped them all stay feeling very positive about this difficult second run. Boucher opens up the gap. 
Well, this is his for the taking or the throwing away of. He just has to keep it solid and safe, I think, and he should take the win over the final crest. Three more wide, turny and bumpy gates to go. That red one really was the last one, I think, that could cause him problems. Just as I say that, he takes a little stumble as he tries to wipe his goggles. Has he done enough? This will be very close. Boucher dips for the line. And yes, another victory for the young Frenchman. And uh, cement, Chiffard <laughs> Plutian, he says, I can see that, can't see a thing. And uh, he now goes to join the celebrations with the rest of his teammate. What a showing by the French. Four in the first five. Only Aaron Lindstrom of the Swedish team able to get in the mix with that French posse. And uh, sixth place is worth a mention. Jesse Keefe, there he is on your screens there. 0.753 the gap, but a sixth place for the rookie American showing that he is really beginning to make his mark on the in the world of para-alpine skiing. Well, a very short break while we uh, adjust the Stargate for the sit skiers and the men line up for their podium. I think everybody's saying the same story there, telling the same story. Sign language, the order of the day. But uh, very difficult conditions with these this wet, wet snow coming down heavily and all the guys struggling to see what's happening ahead of them. Uh, just a quick note, as we leave the podium, let's uh, send our best wishes to Thomas Grocher. It looks like he's just sustained an injury in that nasty crash he had. Uh, hopefully uh, the Austrian has been treated by the medical crew at the bottom of the hill. And if we can, we'll bring you an update on his condition as quickly as we possibly can. So the top three, Boucher for the French, Lindstrom for the Swedish team and the French continue their charge with Jordan Brassa in third place. Today. What was the biggest challenge for you on this slope today? It was uh, really different because uh, the snow was very sticky. Uh, I saw nothing. I was like uh, cleaning my uh, my googles every time, but uh, I was uh, <laughs> like. Uh, Jean-Claude Van Damme in a fight, you know. <laughs> it was really, really a, a great battle, and uh, it was really good to to have uh, to have them in the podium too. Même question en français. Quel était le plus gros challenge aujourd'hui dans ces grosses, dans ces, ces conditions très différentes? Ouais, c'est sûr que c'était des, des conditions quand même très, très difficiles. La neige collait vraiment fort. On a eu une grosse attente là-bas. J'étais en train de nettoyer mon masque en plein milieu de la descente. Mais euh, mais voilà, c'était. Un beau, beau combat, euh, comme euh, Jean-Claude Vordam, on va dire, mais, euh, mais voilà, l'important c'est que je suis arrivé en bas, j'ai réussi à garder la, la place que j'avais au premier run, et ça c'est quand même euh, génial. Merci beaucoup, bravo. Merci. Well, félicitations, congratulations to not just Arthur Boucher, our well-deserved tour leader and winner of the World Cup Globe for our Alpine standing giant slalom. Okay, straight back into the action and uh, Ruven Ackermann of the German team is the first of the men's sit skiing division to get the action rolling on. Now, these bumps down here mm, are going to cause problems. Ruven proving my point. Going down on the side but pulls off for recovery. Manages to get upright again to keep the sit ski or the monoski rig moving. couple of sections which are particularly bumpy. It's not too bad here, but it's still very important to stay on the ideal racing line. I come on getting it into more trouble. I think he'll have to pull up after that one. The rules, just to let everybody know, if the rig or the skier, if the skier comes completely to a halt, then um, in World Cup competition, they're not allowed to hike back up or push back up to continue their run or restart their run. They have to pull off to the side and take a does not finish as their final result. So we knew it was going to be tough. The first runner proves that. Let's see what Magnus Valo Balken for the Norwegian team can do. 13th of 14 runners who completed the first run. 
Falcon here just setting himself up there, taking a little skid before that tricky double into the very tight right-handed blue gate. So adopting a respectful approach here to the Canen piece. So well recognised, it's been one of the more technically challenging runs on the tour. Very steep and thus it cuts through the forests and through the rocky outcrops on the side of Mont Canin. The piste has a, a challenge at practically every turn. Balchan taking it steady here. Kind of good pace though. The last of the bumpiest sections now out of the way. few gates allow him a chance to get real close and clip a couple of them as he goes for the line. And uh, that's our early pace setter, 209.58. Rabbi Drogan having a slight moment there at the second gate just as we joined the live action. Seem to be able to get the edges set up for those first turns. Very wide here, very, very wide. Needs to try to get back towards the line. Back in the groove here. Holds on to the advantage at split time. Smooth turns here, carrying good pace. And got a little twist there just as he went out of sight, but makes the recovery. Sets up high for this bumpy section from that tricky red gate. Passes it safely. Two oh nine fifty eight. The oh. time to be. Oh, oh. Well, I'm not sure if the time will count or not, but either way, that's a massive effort to get safely across the line. Just almost running off the course at the very, very last gate. Drugan, on my screen, it shows a disqualification. I would suggest that that's because he actually ground to a halt just for a moment, but. So at the moment, on my data feed, it says Bachan is the only man in the sitting division who has uh, safely made it. And another one falls victim to this very difficult second run situation between the soft snow, the very challenging piece, and the uh, soft snow falling, making the visibility difficult. Christian Pascal, Pascal Christian rather, for the Swiss team uh, goes off seconds. the course just by the early double gate. Well, experience counts for a lot on a day like this when we've had these delays and difficult weather conditions and snow conditions and experience in abundance sits with the Japanese team. Taiki Mori and on your screens there, Takeshi Suzuki, two of the most experienced sit skiers in the race so let's see how the first of those Takeshi Suzuki deals with uh, the challenges that mother nature are throwing their way oh he's out he goes out on the blue following the double Wipes his goggles and uh, it really has proven to be the one of the most testing, if not the most testing, turn on the hill. Lou Brazdagand next up, one of the most experienced skiers in the shape of Japan, Suzuki to uh, Brazdagand, who uh, is uh, not so experienced, but you can just sense the feeling of readiness from him, ready to charge this course. Ten seconds. <sighs> 
Razdagan, big strong push out of the start gate. And off he goes to these top turns. Even up on the top turns, which aren't so turny, the bumps are starting to develop. French coach is saying, keep it going, keep it going, you're still moving. And just to uh, explain again the rules, so long as athlete doesn't lose all momentum, he's good to carry got carry on going. Yells with the effort to try to pick up the line as he gets dropped late again. So if it wasn't uh, tough enough to negotiate the gates, it's getting bumpier with every runner and the heavy snow obscuring the vision of every single one of these guys. So uh, massively challenging, massively difficult race going on here just now. In this final giant slalom of the season. French coaches urging their athletes on at every opportunity. Braz Dagan, despite those early troubles, is now our leader. Wallo Magnus Balchan of Norway, the youngster who gave it a very measured approach, sits second. But we have four skiers who uh, made the start who have not made it correctly to the finish. So only two out of a total of six in the finish area so far. We have 14 athletes back from a total of 16 who started the first run, so hopefully the attrition rate doesn't increase any further. The guys with the paint, their role has doubled in importance since this uh, snowfall has begun and since it got very, very heavy and very wet about, well, it's almost two hours ago really, isn't it, since the snow started coming down like this. So. It's good to have a pause here to get the paint on because that allows the skiers to get a better level of definition to see where the terrain really is. We were talking about... No blue. And they have a painting. Better. They were like this the whole time. They cannot see anything. Enrique Plante just having a look on his coach's phone at uh, at uh, what's going on and uh, word of warning the blue gate following the first double gate is the one which uh, I think is going to cause it's certainly caused enough problems already but I think uh, we will have further issues before the course has or the race has run its course so another little delay while the painters do their work Selenovia living up to its name. There's certainly lots of Navica going on. So Lou Braz Dagan for the French leads the way. And uh, next up, we saw him there getting a word of advice from his coach up at the top, Enrique Planté. for the start ref to tidy up his workplace, making sure there's a nice solid surface for the sit skier athletes to plant their outriggers so they can get stability and then a strong launch into the course. It really doesn't feel like springtime. There's more like Christmas at the moment here. And there's uh, where we sit at the moment. Two out of six down. And uh, we have uh, eight athletes remaining at the top. Some very strong contenders in there. Remember uh, after the first run. This is quite important in terms to look at the final reckoning. The 
the top three are only separated by 1.40 seconds. So fastest from the first round is our local man, Rene De Silvestro. The Norway star, Jesper Pedersen, he's behind him only by seven hundreds. And then a further 1.37 back is uh, the second Japanese skier, the final Japanese skier of the day, um, Taiki Mori. Now, back underway with Argentina on course. Enrique Plante. Stuck in. There's no other way to go up this hill, I don't think, other than with full commitment. Over the bumps. Really nicely done. Well, brilliant choice and execution of line on the entry to that tricky blue gate. Allows him a relatively smooth ride across the rollers. And despite the certain problems he's having with visibility, he's looking confident here. Keeps the turning action going. Goes deep. Nice adjustment from the blue to red. Over onto the final short steep section. Needs to give this next couple of turns a bit of respect over the bumps again really well ridden there the rig and rider working in unison and uh, barring some kind of disaster an Argentinian skier should be able to make it to the bottom oh that was a disaster but hopefully oh disqualification Oh, that's unbelievable. I said barring some kind of disaster and that really couldn't have been any more uh, of a disaster. What a shame. He was for sure he was going into the lead there. But uh, right through the middle of the flag on the final gate and disqualification is the result for Enrique Plante after an amazing effort to keep himself composed and He'd ridden the top section of the course in particular so, so well. But ultimately, it means we still only have two men on the standings at the bottom. Nicolas. Nicolas Bisquet ready to go. He looks confident, looks relaxed. And we saw in the first run, he seems to have his rig set up very well. He dealt with the bumps and rollers really cleanly in the first half of the competition. Now, ready to do it all again. Uh, looks like the final gate has been repaired, so we should be ready to go. Ten second beep sounds through my headphones, so we're uh, definitely about to get back underway. Have a look at what's going on at the start. Ah, they're waiting a whole interval here. So Nicola Bisquer, he's ready to go. Seventh after the first run. Nicola. Five, four, three, two. Off he goes, builds the momentum, builds the turning force in, in each of these opening curves into this long double. He needs to come high to his left out of that, does exactly that, has an easier ride than many through the bumpy blue gate and now gets on with the job of trying to make some pace, some speed for himself through this middle section, through the gully. Second double gate poses no problems also. And a big advantage on the split time there. 4.12 over the rest of the field. Lou Brasdagand is leading at the moment, but I'm not going to say anything about what might go wrong here because I uh, don't want to give the curse of the commentator to Nikolai here. Into the final steep. And the final bumpy section through that red gate. He 
keeps it going smoothly, heading for the line. And over the line he goes. New best time. And uh, a pretty decent advantage he has from that effort. 5.32 the gap to first from first to second. Uh, the action continues to heat up. The Netherlands team on course in the shape of Niels de Langen. The two seem to have really nailed the top section. Round he goes on the second double, carrying a really good speed. A little late into these following turns, but finds a straight line through the gully. Oh, loses a rigger, but wow, what a recovery to grab that back. Talk about lightning reactions. That was some move by Delanga. Over onto the final pitch. Oh, he touches down, but only momentarily. Well, this has been a wild ride for Niels de Langen. Certainly looking to move up in positions from where he sits. He goes into the lead. 4-3-1 over the rest of the field. 153-73 now the mark for these guys to chase down. Kurt Oatway for Canada, the next of the contenders. Oatway hangs on. Experience counting for a lot in a, on a run like this and very difficult circumstances and Oatley has bags of that. Rides round the rig, skipping a little from underneath him though. Oh and again, Ski lets go, keeps it going, he can legally keep going, he didn't actually stop. Uh, time against our new leader Niels de Lange will have been lost so he just has to stay composed limit the damage, keep these final turns as smooth as accurate and as quick as he can, ride those bumps much more securely on the edge here and uh, charge us on now onto the flats goes for the line Oatway can only manage second there 2.96 and uh, De Langen hangs on to the lead while we look up to the top of the hill and find his teammate Jeroen Krampscher powering out of the start. Wonderful turns here from Krampscher. Time checkpoint coming up in three more turns. Let's see just how much. Or surely he's opening out a lead here. Well, 0.52 he has now. And uh, definitely giving this his all. Amazing skiing. Such deep, deep angles in the turn to develop the force and carve around these tricky turns. Pushing forward over the rows, skips in the air one or, once or twice on that last bumpy section. Uh, now out onto the final flats, goes for the line. Do we have a new leader? Yes, we do. One, uh, Netherlands go one and two. Kampscher overhauls his uh, training partner, De Langen. Kurt Oatway for Canada now down to third. And it looks like the snowfall is just lightening ever so slightly as we move into the top three. Taiki Mori, super experienced skier. Imagine his first games back in Torino 20 odd years ago. So if anybody knows how to deal with this difficult hill, Taiki Mori. Showing he's still got form as well. Took the victory. Uh, amazing result for him the other day. Super smooth down this lower section, but unable to match the Langen's pace. Excuse me, uh, Campshore's pace. 
And now split time graphic shows a red light, 1.31 to find. That's a lot of time, especially when it's uh, amongst the most competitive athletes. So Taiki Mori can't afford any mistakes here. Needs to keep it clean all the way from here to the finish. And ultimately just see what the clock will give him. Here comes the line and the clock stops. 153.79. He goes third for now. And two more skiers to come. Jesper Pedersen. Giant slalom. Alpine uh, tour leader for this discipline. Oh, a huge flight, uh, and the ski comes off on landing. And Peterson, oh, a really uncharacteristic error there, just trying to be a little bit too ambitious. He's okay. He's uh, made a pretty tough stuff, I can assure you of that. And uh, finds himself out in the powder snow at the side. Huge flight there, and uh, the ski and rig hadn't totally settled down. So he, came on to the bumps and the entry to that blue gate and the binding. Don't often see that, the binding letting loose on the sit ski, but uh, really no choice but for the equipment to let him out there. He's actually got the heel piece locked. That's what the course workers are finding a little bit confused and there's a little lock he puts in the heel piece so it really can't release. And uh, once he's uh, got himself safely back on his ski and sliding down the hill, we'll be able to go back to the start and uh, see what's going to happen. The three anxious or a couple of anxious faces down there sitting in the orange suits. The Dutch boys know that uh, the conditions could conspire against René de Silvestro, who now has a unexpected weight up at the top before he takes his turn. The last skier we will see today. There's a lot to play for for De Silvestro. Peterson, we saw the red tour leader, but has 520 World Cup points. De Silvestro has only 480, so 40 between them, obviously. Jesper there on your screen won't be scoring any points today. But uh, but to win the Giant Slam World Cup, De Silvestro, on course, needs to stay on his ski, keep the rig upright, and collect for more than 40 points to win the globe. Let's see what happens here. Well, he's bringing it to the limit. He knows he's got to deliver. I'm sure he'd just like to wrap this up with a victory on the home snow. Round he goes, the second double, no problem whatsoever. Switching quickly from turn to turn. Gets pushed a little wide on the red and into the air. Entering the blue turn. Back on top of the action here. Going on to the final pitch now. Sets it up beautifully for the opening red onto the steep. Gives some shape and space in the turn to deal with the ruts and bumps. Hopefully out of the woods now and Oh, but no, once again, an athlete within sight of the finish goes down. Oh, that really was not in the game plan for the Italian team. Coaches cannot believe it as they get the news over the team radio that De Silvestre has bailed out of the course and thrown away his chances of uh, the victory and with it perhaps a crystal globe for the giant slalom discipline. Frustration showing there I think from the Italian coaching team but oh what a disappointment for René De Silvestro. Just a little bit late on the entry to the red gate forcing him to try to make more of the turn down below the gate where it's rough and there's a bit of loose snow and that's what hooked the ski up and pitched him onto his side sending him sailing past the following blue gate and uh, well literally within sight of the finish within yards of the finish De Silvestro goes out a huge surprise there and the short story there is that he hands the win to Jeroen Kampscher he and Niels de Langen doing a great job for the Netherlands team in positions one and two. 
And once again, experience counting for a lot, as we expected today. Taiki Mori for the Japanese team goes third. Equally experienced Kurt Otway for Team Canada uh, in fourth position. Well, full of surprises as usual. Eight down from a start list of 14 in this second run. Really tough conditions for the mono skiers. And it's a massive congratulations, I have to say, to each and every one of them who dared to push out of the start gate today because that, uh, that really was right on the limit. <laughs> how was it? I think you just need to look back at the pictures and that'll tell you exactly how it was. Huge battle for everybody. Fight for survival, call it what you like, but Taiki Mori there showing us just how bumpy it's getting out there. Niels de Langen, strong and what a wild ride he had. Dropped his rig or almost dropped the whole rig at one point. And uh, Jeroen Kramscher knew he had to do something special to put pressure on the guys following him. He delivered that in spades, and uh, Jesper Peterson failed to finish like wise. crazy the Sylvester. Again. Let's see what he's crazy. got to say. Ah, this was so crazy. After all the start stops and suddenly snowfall and bad, bad sights. But uh, yeah, my first run was like not so good, and I thought maybe we can uh, redeem ourselves. And we saw so many DNFs from the top, so I was like, I need to risk it all because people are gonna have a hard time. Uh, I had a pretty clean run, I was happy with it. Um, I think we did everything according to plan. So I'm really happy with my first place, but I'm really sorry for, for René and Jesper because it's, it's not really the way I want to win it, but yeah, I'll still take it. But um, it's such good racing this week and uh, um, yeah, it's shame for them, but uh, I'm happy for my teammate as well, being on the podium, two Dutchies, it's pretty rare. Same question, can you repeat in Dutch? Yeah, uh, nee, I've been echt super blij met de overwinning natuurlijk. Uh, de eerste run ging niet zo goed, uh, hadden we wat tactische problemen. Uh, hebben we wel goed gemaakt in de tweede run met al die DNF's die, die gebeurden. Dachten we eigenlijk van ja we, moet, ja, we kunnen best wel wat risico gaan nemen en ik heb eigenlijk niks te verliezen vanaf de vierde plek. Um, wel, ja, ik vind het wel heel jammer op de manier waarop het gegaan is. Uh, René en Jesper die, die zijn helaas uh, niet gefinished. Maar ik, uh, ja, ik ben absoluut natuurlijk echt super blij uh, dat ik hem heb. Dus, uh, en ook zeker voor de overall standings voor de Crystal Globe. Ja, ik sta nu dik eerste. Thank you, congratulations. Oh well, another amazing, amazingly insightful interview at the bottom. Do you get the true spirit of what happens out here on the Paralympic World Cup Alpine Tour? Uh, such amazing fighting spirit, but such camaraderie between the competitors as well. Our victor today, here on Camp Schreier, saying he didn't want to win it that way, but he'll take it anyway. Spare a thought for Jasper Peterson and uh, our local hero, René de Silvestro, going out in very very difficult circumstances just in the closing couple of runs well it's been a busy old day here on the, the piece of Sela Nevea started the day in sunshine but it ended up in a horribly wet heavy heavy snowstorm so uh, the world of para alpine ski skiing here at world cup level introducing uh, the newcomers to just how difficult it can be and testing even the old guard to the very very best of their abilities now we have one more competition to bring you from these world cup finals that will be uh, super g tomorrow morning 10 a.m local time is our scheduled start so that's 0900 gmt we want to work out your world clock from there. We'll be back here in Selenavea tomorrow morning to see what the speed kings and queens can give us in that final race of the year. Remember, it will be a super jeep. We'll be starting higher up on the hill. The speeds will be higher and uh, the thrills will be no less exciting. So I uh, hope you can join me here on FIS TV. Uh, for now, I'm John Clark, and I'm signing off from the Alpine World Cup for today. Um, we'll see you all early tomorrow morning back here on the slopes of Sea Nevada.